Hi, it's Emil Guillermo of the PETA Podcast. For the Thanksgiving holiday, we're giving thanks with all our devices. So be safe, mask up, enjoy your vegan feast. Then afterwards, watch the new documentary, Breaking the Chain, now free on Amazon Prime. Produced by Oscar winner Angelica Houston, it tells how PETA undoes the neglect of dog owners by saving dogs left out in the cold. I talked to Daphne Nekminovich, Senior VP at PETA, about the CAP program, which is featured in Breaking the Chain, now free on Amazon Prime. Listen to Daphne now on this encore edition of the PETA Podcast. A dog on a chain outside its home. Normal? It's really a form of dog abuse. A new documentary exposes how it's reached a crisis point in some areas and how new laws are spreading around the country to unchain America's dogs. Breaking the Chain, a new documentary, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, Breaking the Chain. It's a new documentary, executive produced by Angelica Houston, and you can find it on iTunes, Amazon, Apple TV, Google Play, Vudu, and Vimeo On Demand. Or it's on the website link in our show notes. The documentary exposes the abuse that's often found right under our noses in our neighborhoods and communities. The dog outside on a chain. PETA's Community Animal Project is a unique PETA-run shelter that sends out field workers 24-7 to care for the animals in distress in the area around its Norfolk headquarters. And when they found an inordinate number of chained dogs, they realized that this was a problem. By going to local and state government leaders, anti-tethering laws have been passed, and they should be a model for activists to fight the abuse of chain dogs everywhere. PETA Senior VP of Cruelty Investigations, Dafta Nekminovich, runs the Community Animal Project, and she played a major role in the documentary as we see just how bad the chain dog situation can get. My conversation with Dafta on the new documentary, Breaking the Chain, on the PETA podcast. Daphna. Yes. So, so good to see you. Good to see you. Too. <laughs> and hear you. Boy, you know, I saw the the film last night, the documentary, yeah. and uh you know, and you were are in it very prominently as kind of the main narrator, essentially. Um you you, you really you know, the thrust of the narrative flow. How did it feel to see? I mean, I, I know what it takes to film these things. I TV reporter. I've done some documentaries. I know what it takes to go through the whole process. When you see it all, how gratified were you to see it finally? Well, you know, I'll, I'll be gratified, I guess, if that's the right word, when other people see it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I it's very close to my heart. The issues are very close to my heart. And I thought that um, the director did a really beautiful job of stringing the issues together in a way that told the story of these animals, as well as individual animals within the bigger picture. So, um, I mean, it certainly is a bit strange to watch a film about your life's work. Um, But I'm, I'm glad that we have it and I hope people watch it. That's yeah. my, biggest, my biggest hope is just that not only they watch it, but they learn from it and they take action as a result for the animals who are out there because while the film focuses on some of the regions that we serve mm-hmm. and the animals we see, we know that these animals are out there, whether it's Virginia, North Carolina, Idaho, Colorado, California, they are everywhere. So you just have to open your eyes and find them. Yeah. You know, we have talked about the CAP program, the Community Animal Project, which is one of the things you head up there at PETA. We've talked about it before. And I remember when you first mentioned how when you go out to the community, there are dogs in chains. And that was really the first time I really heard 
about it being a thing. I mean, I, you know that people do these things with their dogs. They attach them to change, not just in the country, in the city. You know, I, I, I know someone who I brought my car to to get fixed and he had a dog running around in his, uh, his little lot. I mean, people with, you know, they have dogs in their chain to their backyard. So it's, it's definitely something that happens, but it really becomes almost kind of like a, a negative lifestyle in rural areas. I mean, and that's what shocked me when I saw the film that breaking the chain is really a kind of legacy of canine life. You it know, it really is. Yeah. It really is. And it's, it's stunning because, you know, we see these animals during like one moment of our visit, you know, or our visit is just like one moment in a matter of maybe every few days, if it's urgent or every few weeks, sometimes every few months. And it's easy to forget. I think for people that for these dogs, that little patch of dirt, that tiny little area that they're chained in, that is all they have, literally all they have from morning to night and overnight, 24 hours a day, they don't have anything else. And so, you know, we, you know, you have dogs, I have dogs, you know, we, our lives revolve around making sure they're comfortable, they're happy, that we do the right thing for them. And here we have these dogs who are really treated like a cheap alarm system or an old bicycle or really just some kind of status quo symbol. And they don't have anything they need, even, even basic necessities of life sometimes. And, um, it's a real struggle for the field workers to try and lead by example and educate because sometimes that doesn't sink in. And so that's why we're so dedicated to seeing laws passed that force people to do the right thing. And that's, you know, that's one thing that I'd like to encourage viewers is to take that and make it their project is go to their city council, go to their county commission, go to their state legislators and make it so that one day very soon we'll be able to say, can you believe people used to keep their dogs chained? Yeah. You know, when you talk about chains in uh, say a, a rural setting and really the chains uh, by a, uh, you know, some neighbor of mine who t- chains his dog, uh, you know, the backyard or uh, the, the, the junkyard guy who has a, you know, that's sort of like a, a cliche, the junkyard dog who's chained mm-hmm. to, to keep the, the, the bad guys away. I mean, but it's all the same, right? I mean, the, the dogs are, they peep the, the people who own these dogs have the same view of what a dog is. I mean, that, really, that's what you're fighting, right? Yeah. Or, you know, they just don't have the ability to relate to the dog as an individual being who has needs and feelings. Mm -hmm. And it's almost and we're making generalization, right? Because even within our client families and the community animal project, we most certainly see people who care to some extent about their dogs and some people keep their dogs inside or some people are thoughtful enough to bring their dogs inside if a storm is coming. But we also see so many people who just really don't think twice about, you know, Oh, a hurricane came, the dog, you know, Smokey died during hurricane X, you know, they don't, it's not even a blip on their radar. And, you know, the question comes up a lot and we ask ourselves a lot, why do they even have dogs? I mean, what are you getting out of this other than you have the power over a being who depends on you for everything and you get to deprive them of the very basic necessities of life? You're too lazy to go outside and check their bucket or make sure it's not green with algae. You know, I had one woman tell me, um, I said, you the dog was very thin and I said, you feed him every day. And she said, well, yeah, unless it's raining. And it was very, you know, matter of fact. But I I said, well, when it rains, do you eat? I mean, what what you know, what kind of sense does that make that the dog doesn't need to eat if you don't want to go outside to put some food down? So you have these kind of disconnects. And um, in some instances, we are successful in doing one on one education and and just really you know, you're having to tell people things, you get back in the van and think, did I actually have to say that? 
I cannot believe I had to actually say that to this person, you know, and it can go from anywhere like they need to eat at least twice a day to, you know, this dog is very friendly. I mean, you have sometimes people who keep dogs for other people, you know, I've had you know, family members, oh, that's my nephew's dog, my grandson's dog, and the dog is chained in the backyard of the backyard of the backyard, and yeah. barely anybody, you know, and I had to say to the woman, look how friendly, this dog is desperate to be loved, you know, you don't have to be afraid, she was afraid of the dog, you don't have to be afraid, he wants, he wants, he loves you, he wants you to love him back, you know, you have to kind of break down these concepts very simply, and it's, um, it's a world. I mean, you, I think you can see from the film, it's a different world. It's not the world I inhabit, right? I mean, yeah. it is and it isn't. I mean, psychologically speaking, you look at that and go, how could you do that to another being? You know, it's just so wrong. But then we also meet, you know, the clients who appreciate, appreciate what we do for their dogs and for them so much. And maybe sometimes they learn something. I, we've had hearts heart to heart conversations. I've had heart to heart conversations with people where I get them to understand this dog needs more and the right thing to do would be to part with them. And they, they make that decision. Um, so it's, you know, yeah, it's you, from A to Z, like anything else. Right. You get the whole spectrum and basically you get the whole spectrum. Yeah. And basically it is this education. You uh, People see a dog and they don't see a being that is worthy of love and care, even the basic care, they even just, the basic yeah. Care. And, and that, that comes across in the film, several in, in, you know, exchanges between, you know, the, the field workers and the dog owners and, and the dog owners saying, well, you know, it's an outside dog. I, I don't bring that dog. You know, it's like, you know, you, yeah, you just, I, I love that interaction. Every dog is a house dog. Yeah. I love that interaction because it's so true. And it's that just really juxtaposes that, you know, the, the, I mean, it is a, it, it's a traditional way of keeping dogs in by certain people. And so you, you just kind of, you have to break in, you have to break through that mentality that this dog isn't a house dog because he's large. And this dog is a house dog because he's small. Yeah. Well, you know, that makes no sense, you know. So big people, little people all want to live right. inside. <laughs> <laughs> they, all, they all want to live inside. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean it and it's so education is part of it and and you see that in the film. And that's a large part of the idea of breaking the chain. Maybe we can break the chain if people understand that these are companion animals with real needs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And hope springs eternal. Oh, you yeah. Know? I mean, hope springs eternal. And I, I think, you know, we do from both sides. We tackle this issue from both sides. One is dealing with people one by one with their dogs, one by one, responding to the call after hours if the dog is in need, being there for people if the dog gets hit by a car or gets sick, but also really working with public officials to educate them. And many of them have chained dogs in some of these areas. So you're really up against an uphill battle, but really trying to tackle this issue from the other end where you just make it illegal for people to keep their dogs chained. So in one of our service areas, um, one of the counties in North Carolina that we visit every single day, we have managed to get chaining banned it took about eight years wow. and it um, went into effect July 1st, except it was the enforcement was postponed uh, due to COVID. So that's enforcement will start September 1st. And it's not an overnight thing. You know, a lot of the people that we meet in the field, unfortunately, they're waiting for that ticket. They're waiting for the fine before they do anything. Mm -hmm. But it is a beginning. And it's, it took a lot of education of elected officials, county commissioners several votes and when they finally voted to ban unattended tethering meaning that you cannot have your dog tethered unless you're outdoors with the dog um was a massive victory because it will sort of it'll end the problem it's not going to be overnight but it, it licks it you know it's yeah. like it you're 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 making it a, such that you have the force of law behind what you're telling these people in addition to just being a kind right educator you know, you can also say, by the way, it's illegal because it's inhumane. Yeah, this idea of unattended tethering. You even had to come up with a, 
or someone, a, a lawyer had to come up with language to say, this is what we're against. And, you know, it's not just the chains, although the chains, I was shocked to see how young dogs, all they know is the chain and it becomes part of their body. Oh my, I, you know, it's like if you, if I were born with a chain and here I am an, uh, an adult older man and the chain was just like part of my life. I mean, that, that's what I kept thinking of. Oh my God. I mean, poor dog. It's horrible. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is a prison, you know, they're born into a life sentence from a very young age. Some of them are maybe kept indoors for the first few weeks, but the chain is a prison and it has psychological impacts that are quite obvious but it also has physical impacts. You know, we, we see dogs who have, um, you know, pain. We see embedded collars. We see embedded chains. We see uh, animals who, you know, if they are weakened and their chain is heavy, they're not able to comfortably walk or even stand. You know, it's, it is a constant, unrelenting prison sentence for them. And psychologically, more than anything, it is so damaging, you know, because you visit with these dogs and you watch them. You know, some of these dogs we have, we visit for years, sometimes from puppyhood until death. Sometimes we're lucky enough to get them off that chain before the, their senior years. But in many cases, they are very damaged. You know, they've never been indoors. They don't know how to interact with people other than a couple of them. They don't know what, a, you know, they've never had the, the, the joy or, uh, you know, experience of being around other dogs, being around strangers. They don't know what a doorway is. They don't know what a staircase is. They don't, they, they, they're afraid of elevators. You know, they're, they're petrified of things that we take for granted every day because we're not chained in one area. You know, these dogs don't have the experiences most, well, certainly most humans have, Yeah. but even the dogs that we, you and I call companions who are in our home, you know, they get to experience different areas. They run, they play, they exercise, they, they are spoken to these dogs, you know, they don't have that. And a lot of times that really wears away at their spirit. And yeah. it's, uh, it's very difficult to watch that happen to a dog. And, and especially, you know, um, watching dogs deteriorate over the course of months or years and really knowing, you know, there are specific dogs I have visited with and I don't go in the field every day, you know, but I know from, I mean, there was one dog, especially I remember, and I remember saying to the people, you know, she is so unsocialized and she's just a puppy, but in two, three months, she will be unsocialized to the point of actually being aggressive with people because she's so frightened of them and you have to do better. You have to take her for walks you have to take her to the dog park. I mean, I knew that wasn't going to happen, but I still had to say it. Um, but that, I think, is one thing that people who do care, who watch this documentary, I would like them to feel empowered that they can make a difference. Because these laws, these chaining bans, they are popping up all over the country. And I think there's a heightened awareness and people know that it's wrong to keep an animal chained 24-7. So I would love for this film to serve as inspiration for people to take action for these dogs and other animals, of course. Well, you know, this is one of the things about PETA. They 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 see these things as, you know, as they develop, you know, you see it in the rural areas and you know that this is not just happening there and you're making it a thing with this, this uh, documentary that people now need to see it as the debilitating, heartbreaking, inhumane thing that it is. And I don't, I, I know that when I saw, like I said, you know, a neighbor who had a, a dog chained up or a business owner in a junkyard had a dog, you know, I don't think anything of it like, Oh, well, that's what they do. They're, you know, they're, that's not my dog. It's their dog. That's their choice. But it really is an inhumane act and people should say something about it. And if they Absolutely. see something, it's abusive. It's an abusive act to keep an animal tethered 24 seven. You know, we're not talking about the people who let their dogs go potty outside for five minutes. We're talking about dogs who are kept for, for no other reason other than they bark if somebody approaches or because people think that it's, you know, quote unquote, badass to have a few pit bulls chained in the yard and they breed and sell them. You yeah. know, there's no law against that. And they breed and sell them for a few bucks. 
And if puppies die here and there, that's just the cost of doing business. And they, they don't, you know, they don't think twice about it. I mean, we've shown up at, at addresses where it was very cold and somebody said to me, she had puppies and they all froze to death. And it wasn't even just, didn't even, wasn't as if they were telling me bad news even, let alone yeah. criminal news. Well, they see know? it as a kind of benign speciesism, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, oh, he's, di- he's dead, but, or your dog's dead, but, you know, it's a dog. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, we happen to work in rural areas, but of course our office is located in a city. And when we moved down to Norfolk in the mid nineties, there were plenty of chain dogs in the city of Norfolk and surrounding cities. And over the years we have gotten a uh, tethering banned or restricted in every single city surrounding our office. And that has made a tremendous difference in the amount of calls we get for help, the amount of complaints we get about neglected dogs. Um, and then of course we were successful recently, just this year, finally, after several years of lobbying to get the state of Virginia to prohibit the tethering of, of dogs outdoors during certain weather conditions. And that, oh, yeah. that was more of a struggle than it should have been, but oh, you, it is a, it's a good start. One great story about the dog who's, out there in the puddle in, you know, just, you know, kind of immobilized. Right. And in in the weather and it's, it's so sad. I won't, the people need to see this. I won't give away the story, but the dog needs saving the, even the vet kind of neglected. Well, the, the, the thought was, Oh, they'd last another, the dog would last another 14 hours on the chain outside, but. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, kind people call. That happens with PETA a lot. You know, we have a 24-hour emergency line mm-hmm. for local calls as well as national and international calls. And we do get a, a fair number of calls from people who haven't been able to get help from local authorities, so they call PETA. And I'm very thankful that, you know, you'll see some of the, the animals in, in the film that got help thanks to that after-hours line is that, you know, we'll go out at 11 o'clock at night while animal control will not. Yeah. Um, or some, most animal control will not, not, you know, we, we, even though we push them. So, um, yeah, very, I think that's, that really goes to show that anybody can make a difference even just by making a phone call and not being silent about something they see that they know is wrong, but maybe they don't want to get involved or they don't want to get someone in trouble or yeah. something silly like that. It's like, you know, when you go down that street, look to the left and look to the right, because there may be an animal you're going to make a difference for. Well, I'm just surprised that, all right, I, I watched the documentary. I've talked to you about chain dogs a number of times, but it really hits you when you see the pictures of the dogs and how, how they're affected uh, psychologically Physically, there's a one, there's one dog who actually dies or has got the chain and he's decomposing, right? I mean, yeah. it's like the, the total neglect. No one, no one is bothered to check in on this, this dog. Right. And, and, and that's just one we found, you know, I think yeah. it happens a lot more than we know because we can't be everywhere all the time. Um, and that's why I think it's so important for people who do watch this film as, as hard as it is for people to see animals, you know, not in the way that they wish to have see them, right, um, is that it, sh- it, it is sad, but it's also a reminder that we can do something. Yeah. You know, these are dogs. I mean, people are supposed to care about man's best friend, you know. Most people think they love dogs. Most people say they love dogs. Uh, so here is an opportunity to really change the world for them by, by working to pass a law in your own town, in your own county, that makes it illegal for them to be tethered 24-7. That could save lives. And yeah. it's, it's not that hard to do, and PETA's here to help. But, but the, these laws, you, you say they're, they're, they're beginning to spread, but this is really like the grassroots level of maybe a major national campaign to, to bring anti-tethering laws to the forefront, right? Yeah, absolutely. So they are, they've been starting to spread. They spread very slowly, unfortunately, because it takes time and people get distracted. And, you know, COVID is a perfect example. You know, you bring animal matters to public officials and they're on the bottom of the list on a regular day. But during a pandemic, most certainly they, they take an even farther back seat. 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, you have to, the, the key word is persistence, you right. know? I mean, yeah, I mean, like I said, when I first talked to you about this years ago, you know, and, and I asked, well, what's this documentary about? And when I heard the title, I said, oh, well, I know. But hasn't this problem been solved already? <laughs> you know, you think that, that, that it, but it, you're right. Persistence to make this spread Absolutely. throughout the, Absolutely. throughout the country. And, and just to like our other campaigns, yeah. you know, well, we have to persistently educate. Yeah, it, it it goes hand in hand with the with the uh, with the activism. You know, you, you educate and then and then bring about a change in the law. Uh, tell me, there's some things that though people might think when they watch this uh, this movie, or this documentary, they might say, "Well, you know, why doesn't PETA just take take the dogs? I mean, instead of you know breaking the chain and you know doing this whole bit about laws." Why don't you just take the dogs or why don't you buy the dogs, but offer an enticement to, to, to uh, put the dog up for adoption. And sure. Then, sure. And then, and then no, the, it's a very valid question. I wish we could just take the dogs. Yeah. Um, that's not an option because it's illegal to do that. And if we commit a crime, we won't be able to help any dogs. Mm. We have also found that we get a lot of the dogs by building relationships with their people. And sometimes we will get calls from those people who feel they have no one else to call if the dog is sick or gets hit by a car or maybe they're moving. Mm. And so there is real value in those community relationships. Um, you know, you can offer to, you know, you, you can't, if you buy some, you know, the, the dog will just get replaced. Right. I mean, you know, there's no shortage of dogs out there and it's a, it's a, it's a real tragedy, but I wish we could do all of those things. Um, but we, we just have to work within a certain framework that allows us to continue having a relationship, operate legally and do the right thing and get other people to do the right thing because yeah. it's the right thing. Yeah. And also you, with this relationship comes, uh, the the cat program the community animal projects uh spaying and neutering so you take yes. care of that problem uh you encourage people to uh, to do uh standard uh you know routine vet vet care so that if if economics are an issue you need to take care of that problem and then the relationship comes and the education comes and then the light the light bulb goes off and they say ah oh, we don't care about this dog let's let's let peta adopt it or let's let Peter put it up for adoption. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that, um, you know, like I said, there are dogs we visit for many years, just as a quick example, there, there was a dog that we currently have, uh, now she's actually been adopted by the field worker who never gave up on her and her name is Mingo. And we started visiting her in 2013 and, um, she probably was, being kept in those conditions before to when we found, we found her, but she was in a very small pen prison type of thing. Uh, very, very small with just no room to do anything. And she's a golden retriever chow mix. And, um, you know, this is a dog that every single visit and there were dozens, if not hundreds of visits, we asked the man if we could have her and he was so stubborn and this dog was tucked behind the swing set, you couldn't see her from the house. I mean, I, there was no reason for this man to have this dog. Right. None. Um, and so finally, a few months ago, you know, her, her health began to decline. And, you know, there was a heart to heart that finally, I think he was, we also wore him down, um, which is fine. <laughs> and, uh, and so finally we, we got Mingo and she does have some very, very serious senior, you know, age related health issues and probably her days are numbered, but she's on medication and she, um, is enjoying, you know, things she never knew walks, playing with another dog, snuggling on a couch. Uh, and it's just, it makes your heart sing to see this dog who had nothing, yeah. you know, nothing. She had absolutely nothing, no joy, no respect, no love, no exercise, often no water even. And now she has, you know, everything she could possibly want and the freedom to act like a dog. And you can see the difference. Yeah. Well, you know, the idea of the chain being a prison, 
You know, that's that's a powerful uh, symbol. But some people might see this and say, oh, when PETA goes out there to and the field workers to work with the uh, the owners, uh, that maybe you're enabling these people and, uh, to keep the dogs on chains. Is that the way you see it? Are you enabling them or are, you, are, are we just building relationships here? And that's a tough question. I mean, the thing is that those dogs are going to be chained, whether or not we help those people and help those dogs, those dogs are going to be on a chain. It's not, um, you know, it's not us making it possible for them to do something like that. Obviously we have our dog house program and we give dog houses to people. Um, we always try to get the animal spayed or neutered before the dog house is given. And I, I could, I mean, most certainly I think sometimes there's a lot of inner conflict on our part. You know, are we doing the right thing? Because now this person has a dog house, so they think their dog is even extra okay. There's a lot of conversation, education going. And, you know, if the dog is going to be out there and the people aren't going to allow us to take the dog and the dog is going to be chained, you know, then I would like for the dog to have a proper dog house because that's the only thing they are going to have. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a tough, it's a tough issue, but it's, um, it's a stepping stone. You know, every visit is a stepping stone. The ultimate goal is always to get them off the chain. Yeah. But it means that the field workers and you have to be working constantly and keeping tabs on, on all the dogs. You kind of know where they are. I guess you have a database where you know where these, yeah. where dogs are and you know where new ones crop up. And, but you know, another issue comes up that, well, maybe asking these people to deal with dogs in, uh, if they live in a rural area, are you asking them to really deal with the dog in a kind of suburban middle class way? Or so it brings up issues of race and class and maybe people just can't afford to, to deal with dogs in the way that they, they might be able to, if they had more money or if the, if, or if culturally this was within there, this is, they might say, this is how we always treat dogs, which is, I guess, part of the reason why you need to break the chain so that people treat the dogs better. But how do you deal with that idea that maybe there might be, you know, maybe PETA might be a bit discriminatory in, in, in trying to, uh, to tell people break the chain? Well, listen, I mean, it's free to keep your dog inside. Yeah. I mean, we, we deal with a lot of people in underserved areas, people who are dirt poor, but they love their dogs and their dogs are inside and they call us for help with vet care and we help them. And that dog goes back to a loving home and they know that we are a resource. The issue of chaining, I don't see that to me to, 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 you know, I, I worked in the general assembly to try and see this Virginia law pass. And there was a legislator who stood up and said, you know, this law targets poor people. And I was quite insulted that the implication was, poor people don't let their dogs inside or poor people have to chain their dogs. That's just not true. You know, there is, there is a, a, a sort of emotional barrier. There are people we visit, you know, of various economic backgrounds and various cultural backgrounds who keep their dogs chained. It's all wrong. It's not just wrong. If one person does it, the concept of keeping an animal chained outdoors is wrong and we have to change it. What, it doesn't really matter who is doing it. What matters is that it can change and it's it's free to love your dog. It's free to let your dog come inside, you know, and animals are a commitment. So whether or not the dog lives inside, whether or not you live in Chicago, whether you live in rural North Carolina, if you commit to taking care of an animal, just as if you have, if you choose to have children, you should be in a position. You should be equipped to provide care for them. And that's what the law requires. The law requires you to feed, water, shelter, and provide vet care for your animal. And if you can't afford to do that, which unfortunately a lot of people can't, you know, the thought is that you should be able to vet your animal if the animal gets hit by a car. I mean, that's, you know, that's not a difficult concept to grasp. So there are resources like PETA and others that help people provide when they cannot, because we all have expenses that were unforeseen. But I think the issue of poverty, you know, it really comes into play, not so much with the attitude. That's a different thing, you know, 
Um, I think that there are many people who are very kind that we deal with, who who understand, who listen, who grasp and absorb what we're saying about the fact that their dog is lonely or their dog is really hot, you know, or their dog, you know, doesn't the fight or flight situation that's created when they're at the end of a chain. So I, I think that if people s- see it that way, they really haven't been in the field, you right. know. It's a it's a whole different ball game when they're, you're there face to face because we do actually create. I mean, I'm saying relationships, but in many situations, it's friendships. Yeah, yeah, I, and and that's where that's where you build the empathy bridge from you know pe- person to person, person to dog, and suddenly the dog is not a pet; the dog is a companion animal, and then now you're talking on an empathy scale or on a love scale or a humane scale. And you're not talking about, you know, us and them, you know, us being the humans, them being the dog, because when you talk about breaking the chain, basically you're talking about, should you have a dog in the first place? Right. In many situations, absolutely. And I can tell you that the field workers and, and I feel this way very much when I go in the field, we have for many of the clients and, and the families, we have a lot of love and compassion for the people too. Um, And we see a lot of, you know, a lot of just sad situations and people living in conditions that, you know, nobody should live in, no water, no electricity, um, no ability to, you know, and it's, it's very sad, but I mean, we are very proud and honored to be a resource to communities like that. And I know that we are appreciated by the people we help. Well, breaking the chain Uh, is a documentary that I think should make this issue of uh, anti-tethering. It should, it should become nationwide. When, once you see this, you understand it's not just tying up your dog to the dog house in the backyard or to, you know, protecting your property. It really is an abusive thing. And I think you're going to change some minds there. And I, I hope so. And I think that's a good thing about the, the laws and going to the legislature's, to, to try to change the laws so that people see that there's a responsibility to own a dog, just like, you know, you register your car, you know, there's a responsibility to be a, a car owner, the responsibility. I mean, you know, you, you talked about having kids, having, being in a marriage, you know, you, you got to pay attention to it. Uh, you, know, you know, my wife's chained in the other room, but that's all right. <laughs> no, you wouldn't do that. You would uh, so this is this is a, a real it's a it's a mind shift really that that you're looking and I think people will get it through this documentary I hope so. and and you know but th- all right so you do that in this documentary you show the cap program the community animal project but then there's this part where you talk about no kill shelters and I yeah. think that's important too because once owners say okay I'll give this dog up for adoption or once you find dogs do the cat program. You do work with shelters and yes. there are shelters that do the right thing. And there's shelters that say we're no kill. Yeah. And they probably are full and they probably can't work with you. Right. Most, most. Well, of the time. Uh, uh, we have some very valuable local shelter partners that we've, we collaborate with. And so when PETA takes in an animal who, whose temperament is, um, you know, adoption friendly and who has even some medical issues, Um, very often we will transfer them to an adoption partner and then PETA subsidizes their medical care. But we also take in a lot of animals who are just not viable candidates for adoption for whatever reason. Perhaps they're, you know, I mean, many of the animals we take in and euthanize are really taken in for the purpose of euthanasia because they are on death's door, they are suffering, they are at the end of their lives. And in fact, we part of the way that we help our community is that we offer a free service for people who cannot afford to have their animals suffering ended at a vet clinic. It's quite expensive. Um, at the moment, people are not being allowed to stay with their animals because of COVID. So we are there as a resource and a, a very significant percentage of the animals that we euthanize are euthanized for, for humane reasons. But there are, an, well, I should, I should say because they're at the end of their lives or they're suffering of, of old age related reasons, and then there are animals, of course, we see feral cats who have lost their ears or their eyes, who are dying of infection, who are very sick with leukemia or FIV, who cannot be adopted. 
And we don't favor, you know, quote unquote, releasing domesticated animals into the, the wild where they will die. They will still die. They will just die badly. So we do euthanize animals at our shelter. It's a, it's a, it's a service and every decision is weighed very heavily. And there is, of course, the issue nationwide of so-called no kill, which I think is very confusing to the average person because it all sounds so good. But realistically, no kill policies really just mean that, you know, animals are prevented from coming into the shelter for by, by a variety of different policies like high uh, intake fees, appointment lists, um, you know, these sort of de- delay and diversion mm-hmm. tactics that shelters uh, are doing because they're under pressure to have higher so-called save rates. And what happens is that the animals are then abandoned or, or killed or just given away indiscriminately to people who don't take care of them. They're given away for free to, for free to good home ads on Craigslist and other um, means where we then see that they are acquired by cruel people who do horrible things to them. So we are, very firm believers in open door policies and certainly favor shelters that accept all comers, even if it means that for some of those animals, euthanasia is the most compassionate outcome. Um, There's just a a nationwide movement to pressure animal shelters to reduce euthanasia rates. And so what we're seeing is that the focus on statistics is taking away protection for animals and causing them to suffer because people are focusing on the way statistics look on a piece of paper without considering that every single number in that report is an individual animal. And so we're seeing animals bounced around, aggressive animals adopted and harming people or killing other animals. And shelters are just shying away from making those tough decisions, um, which are very tough. I mean, I've been in this field since 1993 and it's very difficult to make a euthanasia decision. But for some animals, that is the most appropriate and humane thing. And PETA will never turn its back on animals. So we, our shelter is 24-7, open door, no admission fees, no appointment systems. We put no barriers to surrender. If somebody's interested in keeping their animal but just needs some help, we will help them. But if they're done, you know, or they don't want that animal, or that animal, you know, lives at the end of a chain, um, yeah, we will absolutely not refuse entry to anybody in need well, ever. I, I mentioned the euthanasia issue because I know that PETA constantly gets trolled for, Oh, you kill animals. PETA kills animals. And, uh, you know, they don't get the full story. And of course it's usually connected with, well, there's no kill shelters and they're better because they don't kill the animals and you guys kill the animals. But I think in a, in a very succinct way, the film brings up, you know, this idea, you know, you you start off talking about the chain dogs and and then once you get the dogs, what do you do with them? And then ultimately, sometimes it leads to the euthanasia question. And I think you've, you've responded to it here, but once again, for people who still say, well, Peter kills animals. How how do you respond? We're not, we're not breeding the animals and putting them in arms way. We're trying to fix a problem. And the way that we do that is through prevention. That's why we have three spay neuter clinics that go out into impoverished communities. We've spayed or neutered more than 182,000 animals since 2001. We're firm believers in prevention, but we're never going to shy away from doing the right thing because people will make noise about it. It's just like when we speak about, you know, uh, veganism, And what happens to animals on factory farms? What happens to animals in laboratories? And sometimes we, you know, we just have to tell people things, tell it like it is. And the euthanasia issue is very tough, but it's the toughest on the people who perform it. You know, most of the people that we see sort of leading this, you know, push for no-kill policies are realtors, you know, people who have nothing to do, have never had any professional relationship with a shelter it's too sad for them to walk into a shelter. They just write a book, you know, and think they know everything. And the reality is they, they don't know, they have no idea what it's like to run a shelter, work in a shelter and deal with animals who are suffering psychologically and or physically. And sometimes you have to do what's right for that animal, even if it 
damage, you know, damages you. I mean, it's, it's, I think a lot of this, the push for no kill policies is people wanting to feel good about themselves and having to do nothing with what the animal needs. So when it comes to the euthanasia question, it sounds like when it, when PETA is making uh, the decision or when PETA is uh, the community animal project shelter, when the question comes up, it's always the animal first. Always. There are no exceptions to that rule, ever. That's why I work at PETA. <laughs> oh, well, and how long have you been working there, Daphne? Um, it'll actually be 23 years on September 7th or wow. 8th. Well, congratulations for that. And Thanks. And so tell me with this film again, because like I said, the, the euthanasia thing and the no-kill shelter idea comes up a little toward the end but it's part of the whole thing about trying to put the animals first. And it begins at the beginning of this, this documentary, breaking the chain, what could be done. How, how is this documentary? Where does it fit in, in your 23 years at PETA in terms of, well, you know, I wouldn't even know how to begin to answer that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, but is it, I mean, th this has been a, a project that has been really a summation Kind of your of your life's work. Really. Well, you know, I started my animal related career working for an open admission shelter in downtown Chicago, Illinois. So the the issue of overpopulation and homelessness, spay and neuter and, 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 and companion animal suffering is very close to my heart. Of course, I'm at PETA because I'm an animal rights person and I want to fight for the rights of all animals. Uh, but, you know, most certainly this documentary, you know, one of the things that is upsetting for, I think, not just me, but anybody who's been in this sheltering type profession for, you know, a decade or two is that um, we're still struggling with an animal overpopulation and homelessness problem. And to me, these dogs who are trapped at the end of a chain 24 seven, they are victims of overpopulation because in a lot of situations, people wouldn't have dogs if their neighbor didn't have a litter of puppies. You know, it's just this thoughtless acquisition and failure to commit to providing a proper life. Um, so I see all of these dogs that we visit as victims of this crisis. And I, I think that correlates very, very truly to to this idea of no kill, because, you know, I would love for all of these dogs to find happy endings, but sometimes it's not possible. But they I, I, I still, you know, I what they have is not a life what they have at the end of a chain, you know, during storms and hurricanes and snowfall and, and the stifling heat of summer with no opportunity to do anything natural to them. That's not life. You know, that's a very slow death. So we want to educate people on what it is that they can do to stem overpopulation. And I include those chain dogs and the victims of overpopulation. Um, you know, I think the film, I, I, very much hope that it gets people motivated because the reality is these animals are out there. And, you know, just as a quick example, a few years ago when we were lobbying a small town in the area we serve to address the chaining of dogs, the mayor himself said to me, you know, I never realized how many of these dogs were in my own community until you came to talk to me. And now I see them everywhere. Yeah. So it's just a matter of looking. Just open your eyes. They're there. And, and you can do something. And Peter's gonna put in their minds to pay attention and look, to to open your and just pay attention. It, exactly. It's in life. So yeah. uh Daphna, con congratulations again on the film Breaking the Chain. It really is a, a well made documentary, and I hope that it gets um the reception that you're looking for and that people see it and that you. you put it in people's heads about hey, this is a thing. Dogs on chains is a thing and it shouldn't be a thing. We should end it. it. It is a crisis and I don't think people have been talking about it. So we want the conversation started now. Well, we have started a conversation on the PETA podcast. Daphna, Daphna Nakminovich, thank you. Thank you. The head thank of the you. CAP program. It's good to talk to you and good to see you. Same here. And really good luck on the film Breaking the Chain. Thank you, Emil.
PETA Senior VP of Cruelty Investigations, Daphna Nakminovich. She runs the Community Animal Project. And she's featured, the, the whole CAP program featured in the documentary, the new documentary, where we see just how bad the chain dog situation is around Norfolk, Virginia, and around North Carolina there, and really all across the country. It's an issue. It's a crisis. See the new documentary. It's executive produced by Angelica Houston. You can find the documentary on iTunes, Amazon, Apple TV, Google Play, Vudu, and Vimeo On Demand. Or it's on the website link in our show notes. Check it out. It's already an official selection in the American Documentary and Animation Film Festival and the Richmond International Film Festival. Once again, check it out on iTunes, Amazon, Apple TV, Google Play, Voodoo, and Vimeo On Demand. It's a new documentary, Breaking the Chain. And that's it for our show this time out. Hey, you can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or on AMOK.com, my my website. Or or see my work at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund uh, blog. I write there at ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. Our music provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. Join us again next time for more insights into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world. On the PETA Podcast, I'm Emil Guillermo.